now the second, uh, the third speaker of this uh, international symposium, uh, the Greg uh, Fodaro, who is going to speak about uh, optimal sequencing of guide medical treatment for HFF. Dr. Greg is uh, uh, interim chief of uh, ECLA division of cardiology director of ECLA Cardiomyopathy Center and co-director of uh, ECLA Preventive Cardiology Program. He attained the rank uh, of professor of medicine in 2003. He was awarded the elite coordinate chair in cardiovascular medicine and science 2003. His research interest center on heart failure management. Dr. Greg, are you with us? Here, I'm a pleasure to uh, join you today. I'm really uh, delighted to be part of this uh, symposium. I will be talking on the optimal uh, sequencing of guideline-directed medical therapy for heart failure with reduced ejection fraction. There were some questions earlier uh, about this. Here are my disclosures related to this presentation. So it's really been covered, you know, heart failure is really common, costly, but very importantly by the natural history deadly, accounting for really substantial morbidity and mortality. This is recent data from the United States, but there's similar data worldwide. We see that despite the evidence we have and the guidelines we have regarding evidence-based therapies that can reduce morbidity and mortality with heart failure, they'll show large number of eligible patients not treated with one or more of these medications. And even with uh, what had previously been considered conventional therapy for heart failure with reduced EF, we still have patients at very high risk for events. And so our goal is really to try and optimize therapy in a way that we can achieve the best possible outcomes. This is data generated again from the US looking uh, from the Get With The Guideline Registry and patients hospitalized with heart failure under conventional background therapy. And what their survival was after that hospitalization, median survival compared to the general US population. And you can see across these age ranges this tremendous loss of life, even for those aged 65 to 69, compared to life expectancy in the US, almost 15 year loss of life. And for those above age 90, still four years loss of life concomitant with having heart failure and specifically heart failure with reduced ejection fraction. And we've really not, over the last two decades, seen really at the population level, large improvements. Now, that's really striking and surprising when you look at our clinical trials where we have a number of therapies that have been shown compared to placebo when added to background therapy to actually produce meaningful reductions in cardiovascular and all-cause mortality. So they're shown here, if we look at the number needed to treat to save a life over 36 months, these are very low numbers. The vast majority of these therapies are also associated with substantial risk reductions in hospitalizations for heart failure. The real question becomes, well, with these therapies is, what should we use? Are these therapies additive to each other? How should we really think about this? Well, if we look at what's actually going on in clinical practice, this is from a recent US uh, registry, looking at patients' heart failure with reduced DF and how they're being treated. And the vast majority of these patients are either treated with an ACE inhibitor or ARB and a beta blocker, in the U.S., vast majority, two-thirds, not on an aldosterone antagonist, despite being class one in the guidelines and trials. So Cubitril, Valsartan, and only 13% of these eligible patients. When we look at dosing, vast majority of patients are in doses well below those shown to be effective in clinical trials. And when we ask the question for the three major classes of medications, what percent are on target doses of all three, it was only 1% of eligible patients. So we can see what's going on in clinical practice and there are a variety of studies across the world showing similar type of treatment gaps. There's this discrepancy between our evidence and guidelines and what's actually happening in practice. Now this raises the question, are clinicians really believing that they can pick and choose their favorite one or two medications that these therapies are not truly additive to each other? Maybe they're subtractive or redundant or only partially additive. 
But in fact, what I'll show you from our clinical trial evidence that adding one guideline directed medical therapy to another, we actually get a fully additive effect. There've been some hints of synergism, but for the most part, it is each therapy provides incremental and cumulative benefit. So if we look at our beta blocker trials, these were done on a high background of ACE inhibitor or ARB therapy, and we see between a 34 and 35% additive benefit in reduction in all-cause mortality in these trials. And the benefits were similar whether the patient was on an ACE inhibitor or ARB or not. So we truly see this incremental benefit. When we look at aldosterone antagonists, so the ROS trial, there was very little beta blocker use, but added to an ACE inhibitor or ARB, had a meaningful mortality reduction with emphasis HF, milder heart failure, a plerinone added here on a high background rate of ACE inhibitor or mean beta blocker, and we see a similar reduction in all-cause mortality. Again, a truly incremental and an added benefit. In the case of secubitril valsartan, it was compared not to placebo, but to ACE inhibitors, and we see the neprilysin inhibition then provides an incremental benefit for the primary composite endpoint, CV death, and all-cause mortality. So in fact, that the use of secubitril valsartan in replacement of an ACE inhibitor ARB, we could double the cardiovascular mortality reduction that's achieved with an ACE inhibitor ARB alone. So again, nephrolysin inhibition mean additive to background ACE inhibitor ARB therapy. If we look across clinically relevant subgroups, we see we can identify a subgroup of patients that was not better off on secubitril valsartan compared to the ACE inhibitor. So this is not only an additive benefit for heart failure reduced EF, it is a population-wide benefit with the absence of heterogeneity. So again, this approach to treating all eligible patients rather than a more selective approach based on age or or comorbid conditions. Our newest class of heart failure medications, the SGLT2 inhibitors, started off being believed as medications to lower blood sugar and increase that excretion of glucose. But of course, when we look at the cardiovascular outcome safety trials in patients with type 2 diabetes, these remarkable and consistent findings of lower risk of being hospitalized for heart failure, and in some of these trials, dramatic reductions in heart failure deaths. When we think about what the mechanisms would be for these cardiovascular protection, though, this may extend beyond diabetes, and that was, of course, then the rationale of using this type of data from the diabetes trial to actually test GLT2 inhibitors in patients with heart failure with reduced ejection fraction even in the absence of type 2 diabetes. So a variety of mechanisms have been hypothesized, but the key is the clinical signals were strongly there that there could be benefit that extends beyond type 2 diabetes. The DAP-AHF trial demonstrated this, so 10 milligrams of dap flows in versus placebo added to standard background therapy, irrespective of diabetes, over half these patients did not have type 2 diabetes, 4,744 patients, no adjustment of background therapy or diuretics. And these patients were followed and the primary composite endpoint was reduced overall. This shows broken down for those with and without type two diabetes. And we see absolutely identical benefit, no significant interaction and a major reduction in cardiovascular death and heart failure events. We have the Emperor reduced trial that was alluded to earlier, and this had a similar primary composite endpoint and with empica flows, and again, with less than half the patients having type 2 diabetes, we see a similar risk reduction. And in the meta-analysis in Lancet, not only for heart failure hospitalizations, but CV death and all-cause mortality, the quality of evidence we have for SGLT2 inhibitors is that in heart failure with reduced CF, and added to background therapy, we see a benefit. Safety was demonstrated as well tolerated as placebo, so that's really nice to know for our new meds. But are it truly additive to background therapy? If you're already on secubitril valsartan, is there similar benefit with SGLT2 inhibitor? Yes. Uh, MRA, yes or no, similar benefit. So again, this incremental benefit demonstrates.
And so here's some guidance regarding using SGLT2 inhibitors in clinical practice. But now the real question becomes, what's our sequencing? How do we apply this optimally to our care? Well, should we? So if we look across our heart failure meds for all-cause mortality reduction, we clearly see the strongest efficacy and percent reduction, irrespective of what the annual mortality rate is in the placebo arm with beta blockers. This is followed very closely by what we see for MRAs. If we look uh, then at Secubitrol Bessartan compared to imputed placebo, it's right in that framework, and then the SGLT2 inhibitors, whereas other heart failure medications would not rise to this level of mortality reduction. So our emphasis on those four key foundational medications are heart failure with reduced ejection fraction. The cubitrol valsartan, beta blocker, MRA, and FBLT2 inhibitor. But now the key question is, how should we sequence these medications? Should we follow the historical way that trials were done? Start first with an ACE inhibitor ARB, and then only after on full dose, then add the beta blocker up titrate, then add the aldosterone antagonist, then at that point, switch over to scupitrol balsartan and then start the SGLT2 inhibitor. Many have advocated for that in the past. I don't think that's the way to go. This is how long it would take to get on guideline-directed optimal medical therapy if following this historical sequence approach, approximately 28 to 56 weeks. Now, if this were the case that these medications took one or two years till we saw benefit, Maybe we have this type of time and leisure to get around to starting these meds. But the timing is really critical here. And what I hope to show you through these trials that every day one of these meds is not initiated, we are having preventable events that could have been prevented with a more efficient implementation. So this is data for beta blockers, even in the most severe patients in Copernicus, that we see survival curves. This is mortality curves diverging within two weeks. So 14-day delay, there's going to be extra deaths. The risk of worsened heart failure when you start a beta blocker, even in severe heart failure patients, actually that risk is low if you add that beta blocker early in the course versus waiting in the first eight weeks. This is data with MRAs. We see these event curves diverge within days and are significant within 30 days. And this is additive to the other background therapy these patients want. Of course, we have a direct trial of in-hospital initiation of secubitrol valsartan rather than starting with an ACE inhibitor, and that's Pioneer HF, where we see for whether de novo initiation or switching, there was a very early benefit. This is days from randomization in this trial where the curves are diverging again within a week or two, overall a 42% relative risk reduction, about a 6% absolute risk reduction in the first eight weeks, and the benefits clinically were statistically significant within 30 days. So starting ACE inhibitor and down the road, switching to secubitrol valsartan, a large amount of clinical benefit is being left on the table. The data for SGLT2 inhibitors is also remarkable, just published in JAMA Cardiology last week. I mean, within the first 28 days, a 50% reduction in major clinical events after starting dapagliflozin. In Emperor Reduce, within two weeks, there was a 58% relative risk reduction in all-cause mortality or hospitalization for heart failure, health status dramatically improved. And in Sololis, they actually started the SGLT2 inhibitor and in one or two inhibitor in hospital in patients with acutely decompensated heart failure very shortly after discharge. And in the first 30 days, about a 40% reduction in CB death or hospitalization for heart failure. So clinically relevant, large benefits within 28 days of initiation added to other background therapy. So there's approximately doubling the risk worse than what heart health status, heart failure, hospitalization, CB death by delaying initiation of the therapy. So what I think this argues for and have advocated for for the last uh, six months has been this comprehensive disease modifying medical therapy approach where either immediately low doses of all the medications start at once or in rapid sequence over a few days, 
to get all four of these key medications started at their low heart failure doses, a prioritization on up titration over time and the beta blocker that has the strongest dose response, and then the optimization of the other meds. And this type of approach of rapid sequence initiation can allow the early benefits of these drugs to accrue. In some ways, this is synergistic. Uh, having ARNI and SGLT2 inhibitor on board lowers the risk of hyperkalemia with MRAs. These drugs all work in an additive effect. And within 30 days of initiation, we're lowering of that risk by more than three quarters with this combination. What are some of the uh, health effects that occur with rapid sequence initiation or simultaneous approach? Health status improvements within one week, rapid improvements in EF and more complete improvement than you'd see with the delayed sequence approach rapid reduction in hospitalization for heart failure and rehospitalization, rapid decrease in all-cause mortality. And then very importantly, by getting these meds started early and in hospital, if it's a hospitalized patient, there's going to be improved use, adherence, persistence, and overcoming clinical inertia that's so evident. What do I mean by clinical inertia? It's illustrated here in CHAMP. This is 12 months of outpatient follow-up of those with heart failure with reduced HEAP, looking at every time point, and you can see over time the meds the patients were on, they stayed on. The dose they were on wasn't up titrated. The newer therapies, despite being class one recommend the guidelines, patients were switched. There was a question of how frequently patients were on SGLT2 inhibitors. Well, you could say that's not exactly fair to look at uh, before the DAP AHF trial, but for those with diabetes and ASCVD, there were already clear indications from MEMPA reg. What we see for heart failure patients with and without CAD, only about two to four percent were treated with SGLT2 inhibitors. We can do so much better than that, and a rapid sequence initiation can improve it. There are other strategies for improving guideline directed medical therapy that are critical to pursue multidisciplinary disease management programs, guideline directed medical therapy, clinics, telehealth, digital health tools, and apps. But what is so key and critical here is in a very timely fashion, we get these key medications to the eligible patients who can benefit from this approach. Now, obviously, cost and access are critically important. If we do the cost effectiveness analyses, you know, for two of the drugs that are available generically in the US, cost is not an issue. For other two, they are branded, are more expensive. But by conventional cost effective analysis, cost for quality adjusted for life safe, these fall into the high value category. But there's still a lot of effort involved with getting these therapies implemented. Is it truly worth it to the patient? So we tried to answer this question of what's the benefit if a patient's on an ACE inhibitor ARB and a beta blocker of going through the work to switch them, to add an MRA, to switch to secubitril valsartan and to add the SGLT2 inhibitor. So using a kind of network cross-trial analysis and it's published in Lancet in July last year, we looked at the relative risk reductions comparing conventional therapy to the comprehensive therapy. And you can see these huge additional additive benefits, not to no therapy, but to being on an ACE inhibitor or B and beta blocker alone versus this more comprehensive approach. Cutting CV death by more than 50%, cutting hospitalization for heart failure CV death by two thirds. What does that mean to median survival for patients? That's shown here. You can see that following these three steps, can extend the heart failure with reduced ejection fractions, median survival by greater than six years. So, so much of that loss of life that occurs by having heart failure with reduced DF, we can give back with comprehensive medical therapy. And that's even before considering other aspects of heart failure care. So this is worthwhile and meaningful when appropriate, when we can achieve it. So the relative risk reductions illustrated in this slide are the four pillar foundational medical therapies, altogether about a 73% relative risk reduction and absolute risk reduction of 25.5%. The number needed to treat to save a life in just 24 months is a very respectable four. So worth time and effort to get these therapies started. The earlier we get them started, the earlier patients benefit. 
What is the population-wide benefit? This is data from the U.S. If we went from current treatment rates to absolute optimal implementation of our evidence-based therapies, it's estimated 130,000 additional lives could be saved per year with optimal implementation. So implementation is so critically important. These therapies are truly additive to each other and can make a meaningful difference. So hope I've left you with and convinced you that the data are really compelling, that the benefits of these medications are truly additive and incremental. No substantial overlap had been demonstrated for any of these four key medications. SGLT2 inhibitors clearly improve outcome for those patients, even in the absence of type 2 diabetes. The optimal approach is to utilize each of the medications that are demonstrated to reduce all-cause mortality in combinations, so long as not contraindicated or not tolerated, and to really start to the best extent possible without delay, unless there's specific clinical scenarios and why therapy does need to be delayed. A serial or selective approach leads to delays, heart failure, hospitalizations, and deaths that could have been prevented with more complete and earlier use of guideline-directed medical therapy. So this four med combination, ARNI, beta blocker, MRA, and SVLT2 inhibitor, each provide high economic and clinical value and their use at the population level and individual patient level can really have profound benefits and alter the natural history to a more complete degree than prior conventional therapy. Thanks so much for your attention today. Thank you very, very much for this. Last uh, if took any questions. Yes. Uh, okay. Uh, thank you for this uh, brilliant presentation. Uh, my question is that you think that the patient recently discharged from hospital due to acutely compensated heart failure, will he tolerate all four therapies, I mean these four pillars of therapy for heart failure? Can he tolerate a simultaneous initiation of these four therapies at the same time? Yeah, so I think what's so critical here is really the issue of the dosing. Um, nobody's suggesting, you know, starting carbetalol at 25 BID right off the bat or metropolol, succinate at 200 milligrams. But if starting at those low heart failure doses, rather than trying to start the secubitril valsartan titrate up all the way to 97103 before starting the beta blocker or thinking about the MRA or adding the SGLT2 inhibitor, starting those low heart failure doses together. Our approach has been doing this in hospitalized patients before they leave the hospital, even with a short length of stay of three or four days can get all four medications safely and effectively started. For a patient that's just been hospitalized and haven't been started on these meds, their risk of rehospitalization and death are very high. So starting these medications as close together as possible. Now, some physicians are going to be more comfortable with maybe two of the medications, waiting a few days, making sure blood pressure patients feel well, and then starting another med and then another one. That's all fine. It's really that issue of not delaying by weeks or months where patients are going to have events that could have been prevented had the medication been started earlier. I think you need to individualize, obviously, if patients got very low blood pressure, or fluctuating renal function, or their potassium's high, that's going to influence it. Or if one of the medications is too expensive for them and there's no way to get that started for them, you're going to have to adapt that regimen. Okay. Uh, uh, yes, one, one more question. Uh, the dose of dabagliflozine is 10 milligram per day in treatment of heart failure. If I give 5 milligram only, what is the extent of benefit? Yeah, this is a great question, right? With um, the SGLT2 inhibitors, we don't have a whole lot of dose response data. We know in the EMPA-REG trial with dabagliflozine, for diabetes with ASCVD, the 10 milligram and 25 milligram dose, there was similar event reductions, similar cardiovascular mortality reduction, similar hospitalization reduction. The issue of whether with Dapica flows in five versus 10, we would see a difference or the similar outcome. I guess I would turn the question around is what's the advantage of five? The overall tolerability of 10 milligrams daily 
and GAP-AHF is well tolerated as placebo in the patients without type 2 diabetes. There was no new glycemic BKA. There was no increase in infections. So we can get a really significant benefit as well tolerated as placebo. There was obviously more side effects related to worsened heart failure in those treated with placebo. So 10 milligrams safe, well tolerated, and, and gave us a great result. Emperor Reduce used the 10 milligram dose rather than 25, got an excellent result. So I, I very much feel like unless there's a compelling reason, we really should use the agents and doses as studied in the clinical trials, because that gives us the greatest confidence, the results and the safety that we're seeing in those trials will apply to our patients. But that issue of the only way you could get a patient on uh, is five milligrams because they've got to split pills, that's clearly going to be better than no FGL. Totally. Uh, thank you, Dr. Greg, for this uh, comprehensive overview. Um, uh, we have many obstacles to start the four pillars for medications. Uh, among them is the volume overload, uh, serum, potassium, kidney function. But most important is a low blood pressure that not, does not allow starting all these medications. Do you think Evapradine can replace beta blockers in these subsets of patients? And the still simultaneous approach is preferable over stepwise approach in such patients with borderline blood pressure? Thank you very much. Yeah, this is such a great question. And what's so interesting, if we look closely at each of these medications for patients with lower blood pressure, what is the effect on blood pressure? With MRAs, with spironolactone, it works amazing for patients with hypertension and lowering blood pressure. For a patient that starts off with a systolic blood pressure of 90 or 95, there's no change in blood pressure at all in the clinical trials. If we look at the SGLT2 inhibitors, there is some reduction in blood pressure. It's on the order of about two to three millimeters, but it was higher in those that start off hypertensive. Those had blood pressures more in the 90 to 100 range. There was a one or two millimeter change, so very little change there. Now, beta blockers are the most interesting, right, because they often raise a lot of concern. But interesting, in Copernicus, severe heart failure, starting carbetalol in the subgroup with systole blood pressure 85 to 95, blood pressure didn't fall at all. It actually went up over time and went up over time above placebo. So this is not just regression to the mean. And so we often will see, because we're improving cardiac function rather quickly with these agents, blood pressure going in the right direction as EF improves blood pressure going up. So the one where we really have a blood pressure issue is uh, the secubitral valsartan, and it's more so than we see with the ACE inhibitor ARB. So I think that's where, and in staggering the meds and starting at low dose and carefully making sure the patient's not over diuresis, that is the blood pressure limiting med. But I think we need to rethink the other medications because they don't really have that much effect on the blood pressure for those that are lower. But again, that is starting at the low recommended heart failure doses rather than high dose right off the bat. Okay. Um, thank you very much for this uh, excellent presentation. I really enjoyed it. Um, we are very impressed about the results of the SGL2 inhibitors in heart failure. We are impressed about the mortality benefits as well as the reduction in hospitalization. However, I'm under the impression that the anti-atherosclerotic effects of it is actually questionable. We are not seeing significant reduction specifically in stroke. We, in meta-analysis, there was some reduction in myocardial infarction, or at least the direction was towards a reduction in myocardial infarction. Um, in the canvas, on the other hand, there was an increase in amputation, peripheral vascular disease-related amputation. So what's your, what are your insights regarding the anti-atherosclerotic effects of uh, this group of medications in patients with heart failure, knowing in advance that many of these patients are actually having atherosclerosis? Yeah, you know, this is a really terrific question. And, and so to answer it, I'll, I'll put it in a couple ways. For heart failure with reduced ejection fraction in all of our trials and even in the observational data, it's really interesting. There are far less 
atherosclerotic events that you would expect, less strokes that are related to atherosclerosis rather than cardioembolic, very few myocardial infarctions. Now, maybe we're missing some and even less peripheral events. So the major driver of deaths are the sudden arrhythmic death, aggressive heart failure death, multi-organ dysfunction death. And, you know, we see in the trial the, the very significant reductions. Weren't enough strokes or, or um, MIs in the heart failure trials to even discern whether there's an effect. Clearly in the diabetes trials, compared to the GLP-1 receptor agonist, that, that there's a weak signal, if at all, for MI. And I agree with stroke, it's, it's pretty neutral. Fortunately, it looks like the, the distal amputation has not shown up in the cross trials. And even with Kanga flows and wasn't seen in credence, and those with kidney disease. So I think that was a one trial fluke. I think the real question becomes though, you know, what are we ultimately trying to do? And the ultimate arbiter of benefit and risk is that all cause mortality. We see that reduction with SGLP2 inhibitor. So for heart failure, it's really clear. For patients type 2 diabetes with ASCVD, you could make a case, you know, heart failure is their greatest risk, we should favor SGLT2 inhibitors. Others could say, well, no, ASCVD is the greatest risk and I'll favor GLP-1 agonists and others of favor, well, let's use both. The reason don't favor a GLP-1 agonist for a heart failure is when they've been tested in heart failure patients, small trials, the event risk, if anything, has gone in the wrong direction. And if we look at heart failure risk reduction in the diabetes trials, um, you know, it's either neutral or at best you see a very teeny effect, nothing like we've seen with the SGLT2 inhibitors. So overall, for heart failure reduced EF, it is so clear. We also have a clear signal for those with chronic kidney disease, with or without diabetes, the SGLT2 inhibitors give us major benefit. But I agree with you, it's not enough. So it doesn't mean, hey, we're done. And I would go back to our statin trials and heart failure that overall didn't show much effect. That was because so many patients were dying early of their heart failure. We get these other meds on board. They're going to give long enough to have atherosclerotic events again that could impact them. And we need to think about that secondary prevention for our heart failure with ASCVD because we're improving their heart failure prognosis so much. Thank you very much. Thank you very, very much, Greg. Uh, it is wonderful uh, for the sequence of guided treatment. I think we need to, uh, to look to the guidelines, maybe the position statement, maybe the force pillar will be the first treatment. You are going to change uh, from uh, up titration. Thank you very, very much. Uh, I'm looking to see you physically. Goodbye.